Do you miss blogging? I do miss blogging. I miss you blogging. Thank you. I, it means a lot to me. Um, yeah. What I do you miss it, about it? Um, well, the the thing that I feel is missing right now is the sort of the middle, the medium, if you will, between the <laughs> extremely casual and the the long form article. I think one of the cool things about blogs. And I've been thinking about this a lot. In fact, I've been thinking about this for years in Medium and how we can do something about this is, is the, the thought that is maybe a paragraph or, or casual but doesn't get thrown into the, uh, to me, the, 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 the maelstrom of, of social media and tweets is where you, it's, it's just like I'm getting in there. I'm armoring up for battle. Mm -hmm. I mean, whereas a, a blog is like, oh, um, I have a thought. I'm going to put it on the internet. What, what and creates it's that feeling of needing to armor up to battle? Ah, well, the 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 replies. The, the, but the, blogging had replies. You get comments. People link back to you. I mean, that was a conversation. I never right? turned comments on on my blog, actually. <laughs> really? Ever? Um, no, but I wasn't a very Whatever. serious I had blogger. Comments. Um, people got mad at me. Yeah. But I didn't feel that need to armor up. Really? Um, I, I agree with you something's different, but that's what well, I'm Well, the other in. thing is just the the feedback. I think there's this, um, the, part of the beautiful thing about blogging was you were, you were always looking for feedback, but you didn't get it as momentarily. And things kind of had a way they, they, could, they could marinate. They could be out there. You had some time. And um, now it's just, it's, I think there's an addiction to short-term feedback that is um, detrimental sometimes to, to thought. So I'm not, I am asking these questions in part due to nostalgia, but not primarily. The, the thing I want to get at here is as we've transitioned from one communication medium to another, and blogging was really important for politics for all, Twitter I think is probably the most important communication medium, medium itself has become the place where all the presidential candidates release their policy proposals, Barack Obama, Donald Trump are on there. All of these have, these ecosystems have different ways of, uh, of people prosper in different ways. And blogging had links, mm -hmm. Twitter has social feedback, Medium, and then you have podcasting. And I'm curious in how you think conversation online has evolved as we've gone from links to social to the kind of collection of things that we have now. Um, well, I think this idea of getting short-term feedback has changed dramatically. It's very hard to be in an environment where um, people are giving you feedback in terms of either replies or numbers, likes, or, or votes on Reddit or whatever it is. All these systems have their mechanisms. Um, and it's kind of impossible for you to live in that environment and not have it change your behavior. And so I think what, um, if you look at these different systems and how atomized in real time the feedback is, um, you get, um, there's, there's a spectrum, whereas podcasts, very slow feedback, and it's like downloads or subscribers, and you build a relationship over time. It's very, it's, I think that's part of the intrigue as well as with newsletters is you're building an, an unsubscribe is the worst thing you can get from a newsletter. And, but you really have to build something over time, whereas in, in a tweet or a, an Instagram photo where people delete their Instagram photos if they don't get enough likes in the first 15 minutes, um, that's obviously going to drive different behavior. And generally, I think the shorter term feedback is, is often a um, false signal. And I think that's like with our, with our bodies. Our bodies will tell us if we eat something that's healthy over time. If we, but Right away, the thing that um, ticks our survival instincts is the thing that feels right in the short term. Uh, but that's obviously uh, the, the least healthy thing in the long term. And I think all these systems, I mean, many people have talked about it, um, trick our survival instincts into giving the feedback that we want um, or that we, we crave. And we get hooked on that just like we get hooked on sugar. and. And then we'd say, like, well, what are we actually doing here? So Twitter has discussed orienting itself around healthy conversations. Is part of what you're saying just that healthy conversations don't come from instant feedback, that that is itself just a, a wrong lane we're on? Yeah, I think, I think um, instant feedback is, is 
probably confusing to healthy conversations. And um, I think even the idea that other people have batted around about the, the public display of followers, I mean, that's a little bit of slower feedback, but, but likes on a post did, um, if, if we're getting feedback right now on this conversation, I would be incredibly distracted. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just think so that- keep it to yourselves. Yeah, keep it to, please. Um, unless it's, you know, good. Um, I think it's worse. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we've I think in so many areas of life we have used uh, the digitization of conversation, of media, of of other parts of life to measure things that aren't necessarily better measured. So, one of the things I think that imp that brings up is there's been a flight, as you mentioned, to podcasts. There's been a flight to newsletters. It feels to me that one of the big underlying trends, also the messaging, is a flight to context, mm -hmm. a flight to places where we're going to be judged in more context. Mm -hmm. That for some time we kind of ripped context out of things, right? There's less context in a blog post than in a face-to-face -face conversation, say. There's a lot less in a Facebook post or a tweet than in a, a blog post, potentially. And now we're moving back in these places of, of context. What do you think the opportunities are there? What, what, what do you think can be created if you were a young designer to, yeah. to build context back into things? Uh, well, I think we're seeing some things. I think stories of, of Snapchat or Instagram mm -hmm. variety are an example of context as well. And I even think if you look at other forms of media, obviously with um, even uh, scripted streaming television shows, um, designed as they are on, on Netflix, for instance, they they don't have to have the recaps and they don't and they can build longer stories over time which allows for more complexity more nuance that is a part of the same thing and part of blogging was I actually looked up I had a, a a blog post not a tweet from 2001 I just randomly looked at at my blog archives that said it's cold in here that was a blog post it has its own web page and um, it was like, obviously that's, that's not the world's most, I wasn't as good a blogger as you were, but, um, but that makes no sense out of the context of yeah. my blog. It makes a little bit of context sense in the context of a tweet, if you're following someone over time and know that person. But now we've, we pulled everything out and, and same as an article. And, um, I think if you, if every piece of, um, communication has to stand on its own, uh, it has to stand on its own, you lose, um, you lose the ability to go deep. You have to stay at the superficial level because it has to be just like a TV show. Instead of being part of a long form neg narrative, it has to stop and end in this atomized chunk. So something I think is interesting about that is there are so many places now that people build their identities online simultaneously. So you're, it's cold out here or in here in this room. <laughs> Tweet my or post would have gone to Twitter maybe, yeah. but pictures would go potentially to Instagram. Um, you know, a certain kind of message would go to Snapchat. Something would go to Facebook. A piece would go to Medium. Whereas, you know, when I had a blog on Blogspot, I had recipes that went up at the end of the day. Sometimes, I, like people put photos of their cats there. There is a context that comes from collection, and I wonder if something that is a little bit of an underplayed dimension of the current feeling of fracture and decontextualization is just that we're trying to have identities in too many places. Mm. That people are trying to be in too many places at once and there's only so much of us to go around. And that we've just all gotten um, spread too thin. Perhaps, I mean the other, of course there's a flip side of you can, you can post a photo to Instagram and, you, and it's appropriate for that context. So there's the context of your own stream and your own creation and the context of the conversation you're entering. And that has obviously tons of benefits too, whereas if, if your blog, if you're writing a political blog and then you, you type it's cold in here and that's like, go, go send that to Twitter. We don't, want to, we don't want to get that there. So I think that's part of it. I mean, not everybody tries to be on everything. They kind of find the, the context and conversation that makes sense to them. But I, I think there's, there's uh, some new forms that are yet to be created that maybe take, take the best of these different worlds. Do you think that the political conversation in this country is better than it was 15 years ago? Um, 
I think it's noisier than it's ever been. And that, that makes it hard for anyone, even if they, they really want to hear many perspectives. I think it's harder to, to do that. But I also think there's, there, there are the, the bright spots out there that are, there's smart commentary. Um, I don't know. You probably know better than I. But what overall, I mean, do you think that we are doing a better job as a country having a political conversation today than 15 years ago? I don't. No, no certainly not across, you know, across different perspectives. That's a pretty, I, I was thinking about this the other day, that's a pretty profound indictment of yeah. all of us, of in yeah. this room, of the media. Yeah. I mean, if we have so much more technology, we have so much more information, if I just told you that in 15 yeah. years we'll have access to basically all political information ever written, all at the right. same time, constantly, and a ability to speak to audiences that we never imagined, you think it yeah. would have gotten better. Absolutely, and way beyond politics. And this, yeah. is, this is why I started working on Medium seven years ago, was after working on the internet for 15 years, I thought, well, we, we need to take another crack at this because the reason I got excited about the web in the first place was because I thought it was going to make us all smarter. And it's like, how, how incredible would it be once anyone who has an idea or a thought or a story can put it out there for free and you can get access to it and, and there's going to be this exchange of ideas and infinite knowledge available at your fingertips. Obviously, the world is going to be smarter. We're going to make smarter choices mm -hmm. personally and as a society. And you know, I looked around, uh, you know, a, a cycle before the the, the Trump election. Was like, we're I don't think we're getting smarter. I think like the feedback systems and the incentives have made it so um, we're actually not making the most of all this stuff, as you said. Well, what is the critique? So the feedback system is one. What else? What, what else is behind us? Well, I think part started? of it is just the the limits of of the human attention span is we, more information doesn't make us smarter if we don't know how to digest it, we don't know how to contextualize it. And um, especially when there are industries who are dedicated to manipulating those, those information sources for, to make you buy shit or make you vote. And even, even without fake news, I mean, advertising-driven media is, is paid for by corporations who are trying to hijack your attention to buy shit. That's the, the point of it. That's the vast majority of, of the content we consume is paid for in that way, and, is, and it doesn't you know, necessarily serve the consumer. You guys have, a Medium, made a push into subscription. Do you, why do you think subscription is a better model? Well, I think subscription, I think what's really important is the customer you're serving is paying for your product. You have to produce a better product than if someone else is paying for that product, and and like I just said, in the advertiser case, so subscription is the most common way to do that. I don't think subscription or recurring revenue is great from a business perspective, as Scott was saying. But um, it's what's important is you're creating a product that is wholly dependent on um, someone finding it valuable enough to pay for. Then um, that's the type of feedback loop that I think is is much better than uh, the game of advertising, which is how cheaply can we get someone's attention so we can sell that attention. So my worry about the move to subscription, and it's something that I think is a good thing overall for the industry to be diversifying back into, but, but my worry about the, subs the subscription evangelism is that I see a couple reasons people pay for things in the media space. One is that it is fulfilling a direct service. You are a lobbyist, so you need the trade sheets you know, in, in, in DC, or you are in finance, so you need the Wall Street Journal. Um, or you lived in a town, and the local thing was, the local newspaper was what you get. And then there's, you know, it's just so good, which a couple things are, the New York Times say. And then what I see as people moved into subscription is a really intense focus on identity. Subscribe to me because I'm the one who's against Trump. And if you subscribe to me, you're part of the resistance. Subscribe to me because you love Donald Trump and they're trying to shut us down. I think if you look at the things that get a lot of membership, you see a lot of, um, you don't always see the appeal to the, yeah. to the higher good. The subscription in a loud, crowded marketplace, that the way we see people standing out again and again is making this more emotional, more um, identity-oriented appeal. Yeah. I think that is one way to drive subscriptions, and, and you're right, that definitely has its, its downsides. Um, 
and with with advertising, I should say, I think you can do that and have um, and not create the the feedback cycles. But a big part of that, by the way, goes back to the short term feedback cycle. The the old idea of, of we build a brand that's known for quality content and a and we're reliable and we and um, our readers have affinity for us. Can, and that's the game is very different than how many page views can we get as cheaply as possible, which is the programmatic and increasingly the online advertising game. And that's a completely different game. And that's why it's much more detrimental than it used to be to be advertising driven. So um, a, on, on the, are there downsides? Can, can the subscription business have these um, feedback loops as well? I think absolutely. What you're describing is happens it's not what we see on medium because we I think that's a that's news and that's especially political news um, I what we've been happy to see do you have on medium now uh, not a number we share but um, it's it's a healthy number it's growing nicely and they're not we we for the most part don't have that news and um, or you know we have a lot of political commentary but primarily people subscribe for uh, ideas, perspective, information. It can be everything from health and um, to JavaScript and, and literary you know, writing and commentary. And it's not, it's not really about, um, it's, it's not tribal at all. That's it. I think people, people appreciate the value. They appreciate a clean experience. They appreciate having a, a service that that presents them the things they care about and it's not as noisy as the wide internet. Well, this is the other thing that I think subscriptions gravitate towards, which is bundles. Mm -hmm. So Medium is a bundle of anyone can write there and then you've, you've pushed back into having a number of different magazines. Mark right. Bittman is doing one for you, Roxanne Gay. Um, right. there, are, there are a bunch of tech ones I get in my inbox. Um, Apple bought Texture a couple years back and has now created this Apple Plus, which is sort of like a moving towards trying to be, I think, a, a Netflix of, of yeah. subscriptions. Where Box is in there, a bunch of others are in there. Um, is, is the move to subscription, and particularly also the need to, to have some bulwark against the big platforms, is it going to create a lot of, of media consolidation? I think it's it's... My, my prediction would be, and I've written about this, that I'm very bullish on subscriptions for editorial content, and it will be very hard for most websites or standalone publications to drive a subscription on their own mm -hmm. in the same way, because it's not a great consumer value proposition, both for convenience and cost reasons. And so it's like the analogy I use all the time, we don't subscribe to TV shows individually, we don't subscribe to musical artists individually. The big bundle subscription that's, that gives you a lot of value, a lot of optionality, and is personalized around a great experience, is that's a great consumer value proposition. Television is incredible, music is incredible now, and um, I see the same thing happening for editorial content. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to build with, mm -hmm. through a combination of original publications, and, and our model is to build these both with owned and operated publications, with partners, as you mentioned, and to leverage the diversity uh, of the platform, which has hundreds of thousands of people writing every month. Who do you see your competitors as in that process? Who else do you think is trying to offer a bundle that is big enough that it will be competitive in the subscription space? I think what we do is, is unlike anything else right now. I think you, you mentioned Apple has a, a bundle of magazines that, that they've now launched. Um, I think ultimately, the, I think the really good news is that the, the market is being retrained pretty rapidly. I think for, for 15 or 20 years, people have said, oh, it'd be great if people paid for information on the internet, but no one does. And, and you, if you do surveys saying like, why would I pay for information on the internet? That's, and it's like asking people if they want to buy a sandwich when they're sitting in front of a free buffet. It's, but the buffet starts going away, people still need to eat, and there could be, you know, there's still free food and it's in the dumpster out back, but you know, that will always be there. But, and so the market's getting retrained, supply and demand are kicking in, people are realizing like in these other media categories, that you get a better quality and you get a better experience if you start to pay for it. 
um, that's that's a good thing. Now, so as people are, but I think there are limited slots. So everybody has maybe a few slots of media subscriptions that they will allow, and it's not dozens. So I think we are competing with anyone else who's in the mental space of where do I get my information um, that that you know gives me knowledge, tells me about the world, what's going on. And so it's every individual publication that has subscriptions, maybe a bundle. We think that a great bundle of original content is going to do well over time. Tell me about the advertising side of it. When I look at the struggles of digital media in the past couple of years, the thing I see above all is there was a bet made that the scale people were seeing on Facebook video, the scale they were getting um, sometimes in Google search across a bunch of Facebook incident articles, mm -hmm. that that would be monetized. Mm -hmm. And that bet largely didn't pay off. So the bigger of a bet you made on it, BuzzFeed made a very big bet on Facebook video, that bet didn't pay off and, and BuzzFeed has struggled as a result. Is there a world where digital media is able to figure out advertising such that it can build really big businesses on it? Because if there isn't, and, you say, and as you say, small organizations can't do subscription, then you're talking about a real reaping of the small well, and mid-sized publishers? Maybe, I think there's an opportunity for small publishers uh, to not necessarily have to do their own distribution and monetization. Not everyone who, who makes a documentary or a TV show has to set up a website and take credit cards and, and sell that. I mean, or there's more musicians making money than ever before um, in, in the middle class and of uh, musicians and that the top ones aren't earning as much because you can upload music to Spotify and these stream services and you can get paid. I think the same thing can happen. We pay about 9,000 independent writers separate from our publications through our partner program, uh, 9,000 a month and, and that's, you can show up, you can write one thing, you can write every day, you can build a following, you can get paid. And we're starting to work with publishers to do the same thing. And so I think there's good, I'm optimistic that there's gonna be a world where you can focus on creating very valuable content for a specific audience and use um, and join forces with, with others and do a lot better than you can on your own. Do you think that, we just had Scott Galloway on stage and his big argument um, laced throughout that presentation was that we'd be better off if a lot of these big players were broken up. Do you think that in the space we're talking about, the media space, that anything would change if Facebook or Google or Amazon were broken up? I think, well, go, going back to the other question, whether I, there are advertising businesses that will work. What doesn't work is competing in a commodity business with someone who has way lower costs and way greater scale. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so a company like Vox is, is, you guys are very smart about, you don't try to compete with Google and Facebook. If you're selling to advertisers about how can I buy these eyeballs or how can I buy this demographic, they're always going to win. And so I think if the, the media companies that are going to thrive are going to get out of competing directly in a commodity business with, with entities that have far greater scale and far lower costs, because that's how you win a commodity business and that's the business of, of pure attention. And um, if you can get out of that business, then it matters less whether these are broken up because it's the internet creating content and paying especially for quality content is never gonna win the commodity attention business. You made an interesting point to me backstage that one of the things you've been working on at Medium, um, and that was true on Twitter and Blogger was, what about that person who they don't want to be in the business of content, mm. but they have something to say. They have an essay, they have a tweet, they have an insight, like one or two or occasional. And there are a number of solutions for that in text. Mm -hmm. um, YouTube, for all its issues, is a pretty good solution for that in video. But there isn't really a solution for that in audio. There isn't a place where you can go right. put up audio and it has the distribution if you really have something to say. Um, what might that solution look like? Uh, medium. <laughs> Do you guys do audio? Uh, in that way. We, we don't allow, um, we have audio versions of, of many articles. We don't allow UGC uploading of audio. Uh, but yet one of the things, and I don't think there are a lot of solutions for, for text, is our, our idea was if, if someone has a story to tell, um, we want to give them the best place to put that on, on the internet. And that's, um, that's where a lot of our great stuff comes from, is people who aren't regular creators or journalists, or, but they have, they have one great thing to say or one thing, one thing a year. 
And so I think why not? Why couldn't the the same thing exist for audio? It's the flip side of that context. Podcasts are incredible because you can build a relationship with an audience over time. You can go deep. You can you can refer to things that you said last time. Uh, but I would love to listen to standalone stories as well for audio. There there's a few companies that are that are doing audio versions of articles, but um, something we might explore. Speaking of user generated content, it is time for Q and A. So what do you all got for Ev? We have a microphone there and a microphone there. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, empty microphone. Had to take the opportunity. Um, I listened to a talk you gave years and years ago. I think it was at Stanford. It was before you founded Twitter, and you were just like riffing on this idea you had of, oh, wouldn't it be cool if like smart folks can throw their idea out and people can follow them? And it was just cool to listen to because it was. I don't know if Twitter was even in your head back then. It was two years before the founding. Um, are there any? Riffs or thoughts that you talk about <laughs> with your colleagues or friends um, that you're really excited about. I'm not looking for the next idea that I'm going to go do, um, but anything that you talk about that you find yourself repeating over and over again in in your most exciting conversations that maybe falls somewhere on that spectrum. Uh, there are, are ideas. We've been doing medium for seven years now, and so um, and it's always been with the same idea. We we pivoted the business model once from we were pursuing a more content brand driven idea and we um, changed the subscription. Everything else, the goal has always been the same, to enable people to share ideas and stories. And what I've I've had like I keep coming back to the same ideas. And some of them we've done, some of them we haven't gotten around to. And a lot of them are just features, but but I think there's something around mobile storytelling that is not yet figured out. I think there's we we invented this format on Medium called Series, it looks a lot like tappable stories on other platforms, mm -hmm. except it's the opposite. It's not ephemeral. It doesn't go away. You can add to it over time as episodic and you return to your place. And we didn't, we didn't nail the implementation, but I was captivated by that idea. I'm captivated by the idea of, of picking it up into a stream where you left off and, and telling a story as it evolved. There's an old news product called Circa. I don't know if you remember that, mm -hmm. that, that um, built off stories as they go. I think, that's one of many, many things where uh, we've, we've sort of gotten stuck in a particular form that is not dramatically different than what we did in newspapers and magazines. There's the article and you scroll through it and then you're done. And I think there's so much that we have not yet taken advantage of, of the devices, the software, and the network yet. So that's just one example I could, I could go on. Thanks. Thank you. I'll take that idea. And <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, John Ford from CNBC. Howdy. You talked a little bit at the beginning about the unhealthy nature of instant feedback. Any ideas on how to undo that? Um, yeah, I think we could build systems where we don't emphasize that as much. As much, I think people want that now. And um, again, stories are an example. But um, the, I think the. Playing off vanity metrics and uh, what did you call them? Ego? No, that was identity. Um, it's, it's. I think it's a little played out. I think a lot of people are tired of that now. I think there is, um, there's a company I'm invested in called Visco, which, if you're not familiar, is a, is an amazing photo sharing application, um, and there there are likes, I believe, but no like counts and no follow counts. And people love it because it's, a, it's freedom. It's, it's the ability to focus on your creation and put yourself out there um, without without being rated next and ranked next to everything else. And it's very successful. It's growing like crazy. I think it's it's a sign of just like you, if you focus on the art and the, the expression, um, you no longer need the that necessarily that novelty. Um, so I don't know. There's, it's comes down to product design. I'm a product guy, so I just think like how you can get in the nitty gritty of designing it. But I think it's kind of a, a time is uh, a idea which time has come. I was Does struck by Instagram saying that they were beta testing just hiding likes. Yeah. You could see them yourself, but it wouldn't show up. I, w I wonder why. Like, is it just kind of the the titans of tech feeling guilty? They just made all this money. People are hooked on on the short termism, and, and so now we're feeling a little guilty. So we want to experiment with doing something differently, or is there a different motivation? No. I think there's there's a there's a, a feeling that it goes back to the there's a short term versus long 
long-term thing. Like people get burnt out on these systems because it's exhausting. I think we've conflated uh, the positive sides of connecting with humans over these, which can be, you know, terrific. And um, on a social level, we've conflated that with with competition, social competition. That and that social competition at all times is exhausting um, emotionally and to our psyches. And uh, so I think. If, it, if that's exhausting, even from a business perspective, is it can't last. People will burn out on these systems. I mean, that's, you know, many people have, many people have shut them off. Okay, can we keep them on? Can we build a healthier relationship over time by taking away some of the, some of the stuff that is just like fun at first, but ultimately not rewarding? Hi there, uh, my name's Rich Klein. Um, Howdy. Um, i huge. You know, believer in what you're doing um, with the content on Thank media. Thank you. It's fantastic. <clears throat> I have a couple questions. One, um, and I'll, I'll take these off the air, but first one is, uh, do, do you think hyper-local media is actually a, a sustainable business? Um, local oftentimes is the chronicle or something mm -hmm. to that size, but the hyper-local feels like there is an economic you know, model that works, and how does that filter up into platforms like Medium. How can it? Mm -hmm. um, and the second is, when you're trying to encourage companies to publish on Medium, um, which I've done as much as, as possible, the conflict is always they want to own the content down the road, and they don't. Once it's on Medium, there's these platform challenges that they're going to have. And so is that something you see as solvable um, that allows that to, uh, you know, that more direct kind of filtering and content yeah. from the companies. And are you talking about companies like doing more kind of corporate communications or, or media companies? Uh, it's, it's, it's corporate communications, but okay. it's also all the, you know, the engineer, you know, it could be really yeah. great technology. Netflix engineering like blog on media. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, the, so on, on the first one, uh, I, I think local, I, I mean, I can only, speak to our model. I think local will work in our model um, at scale once we have enough people in a lot. I'm not sure about hyper local. I just don't know the economics of it. We we have a small publication we own that we bought called the Bold Italic. That's a San Francisco kind of arts and culture uh, magazine. It's it's tiny in terms of, of budget and scale, but it ROI wise, it, it looks good. And I think as our subscriber base grows, it obviously in San Francisco, it makes that easier. And that's something we would try to replicate. I think again, the bundle economics are great because we can, even though it's a, you know, not all our subscribers are in San Francisco, those that are, they, they get that as part of their, their bundle. And it was way easier than trying to build a subscription for that individually because it's, it's frictionless. Um, so I'm optimistic about that. It's, it's so far ex the experiment level. On the, the company side, just one clarification, you own your content on Medium if you, if you, if you publish it as a company or as an individual. Uh, I get your point though, it's probably more about control and do, can you control everything about it. Um, I think that's, that is a trade-off with any platform for sure. You, you have more customizability, control, et cetera on your own website. I think what the reason people publish to Medium as company is the same as the reason they do as individuals. It's easy. You're more likely to get, get audience and distribution. You can build uh, a following over time. So thank you. Last question goes to Neelai and Jim Bankoff. We're going to do them both real quick. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this. <laughs> I think I contractually need to let you both go. <laughs> uh, we've asked every other platform executive about content moderation. How many content moderators do you employ? Do you have policy people writing uh, policies of change? We heard that uh, Instagram's policies were, or Twitter's policies were a living document. Uh, and how much content have you taken down? Um, what, we have content policies that have changed over time. Um, I'm not sure exa exactly when and how many times, but, but they, they have at least a couple times. Our, our content moderation is um, rather ag aggressive in terms of what we're willing to take down. Um, and having, having served on the board of Twitter for, you know, tw 12 years or so, and I'm now off. Um, but, um, I, I always saw these companies having different roles and, and Twitter, um, I don't think that, that the policy was wrong. I think with medium, we never saw our role as being the place 
for for um, for all voices. We thought there there is um, other places to do that. So we've been fairly aggressive in taking content off. Is not for um, including behaviors of people who wrote it off platform. So if someone is harassing people on on Twitter and they post on Medium, we've taken them off even if they've abided by otherwise like our policies. Um, and we have what what we do is actually curate all the mediums. So we have two different things. We'll kick stuff off as a violation of rules or um, policy. We also everything we recommend on Twitter, unless you directly follow the person, if we recommend it, if it gets in our algorithm. It's first um, has to be approved by a human. So we, we have a, it's very unusual what we do as an open platform where we, we have dozens of people, I don't know what the total number is right now, who spend time going, going through stories and unless they hit yes, it doesn't get into our content recommendation system. So it can be hosted, but it won't get the benefits of our distribution. So that seems like a luxury of your size. Are you going to be able to scale that if you get big enough to make up? The nice profit? thing is, it's a, it's yeah, we're no nowhere near in terms of pieces of content with the social media. We probably never will be because articles are a much heavier lift. Not as many people create them. It's also a luxury of our business model, and our our business model subscription got better as we started creating um, the the curated content. And we curate things. Our our value exchange with independent writers is if you want to be distributed on Medium, um, we we will put you in the curation pool. pool and um, if we curate you, we're going to put you behind the paywall. So that that's our exchange. Instead of we're not going to put ads on your on your piece, but it has to meet our standards, and and we're going to have to um, be able to monetize it. So that I think will scale. Jim. That was, that was my question, Ezra. We're good. Uh -huh. <laughs> Eli stole my question. All right. Well, with that, um, thank you to Ev Williams. This is the final. Thank you.